How can you create consistent, growing, and profitable revenue streams? Well, with over 25 years of leadership experience in successful B2B and B2G sales and business development, my guest today has seemingly unlocked the code. And to hear him say it, it's hard to do. And that's why he dedicates his time to serving as a sales leader, specializing in providing strategic insights and implementing impactful tactics. Let's see what makes him so buzzworthy. Welcome to the show, Rusty. Thanks, Michael. Great to be here. Awesome. And yeah, you're, where are you calling in from today? I'm in Tucson, Arizona, hence my pictures here of the desert landscape. Oh, there you go. You didn't get enough of that out, out of your front window. You have to have it inside as well. I have it right. I, it's where I'd rather be than sitting on a Zoom call. I like talking to you, but that's my happy place, you know? <laughs> well, I feel like an on-location studio is in the works for your company. I, I, I love that idea. Trust me. That, that, would, that would be nirvana for me. There you go. And then you, what you could do is it's like, okay, so the if you want to meet me at my office... And whatever ledge right. you're, you're happen to choose out of those six behind you, uh, is where that's they right. You got to you got to put your hiking shoes on, get your water, and and you got so many miles to go to reach the destination. There you go. I mean, if you if you really want one to one time with Rusty, you got to work for it. Come on, that that's what it takes, you know. <laughs> so speaking of hard work. And mm -hmm. figuring things out and doing the the hard stuff. We we I mentioned a little bit about you unlocking the code in uh, growing companies uh, profitably through sales leadership. So tell me a little bit about mm -hmm. your business. How did you get started? What why is this a passion of yours? Yeah, you know, Mike, I, I would love to say there was some master plan that got to me where I was, but I I started off my career uh, as a semiconductor engineer. Uh, I always love technology, moved into product management. And then in, in all those roles, I was always working with customers, even in, as an engineer. Mm -hmm. uh, and then an opportunity to go work in a sales department uh, mm -hmm. and r really found my cadence in. You know, it, it, was, it was the technology uh, and working with customers uh, that really became my passion. And, it, and that's what I've done for almost all of my career now. So, uh, you, you, I mean, you skipped right over the fact that you went from engineering to sales. This, most right. people, when they hear engineers, they don't hear people person. <laughs> yeah. Personality. Well, so, what, I, so how did this even come yeah. about first? Well, it, it is part of the DNA. So my father had a sales organization. Okay. Uh, so you, you can in some way say it's the family business. Uh, and I grew up in that. And, and then my first semiconductor job was working with customers because I was the most junior person and none of the other engineers wanted and liked working with customers. Uh, so they sent the new guy out to go work with customers, which is what I enjoyed anyways. <laughs> so it was like, I was like, okay, I'll go do this. You know, so <laughs> it, it was just kind of the natural fit for me. Gotcha. And so you did that for a few years. And then, so what made you leap out into your own and start your own organization? Yeah, um, I did it again, purely by ha happenstance. I'd been with a company that got acquired. Unfortunately, the acquirer bought the business for all the wrong reasons and ran the business into the ground. Mm. Uh, and, I had, and I had to shut down a division. Mm. Uh, so I was shutting down a division. And as I came out, I'd been in, in the industry for 20 years and and had a presence mm -hmm. and immediately I had companies coming to me going, Hey, Rusty, we could use your help over here, but we don't need someone full-time. Can you do this part-time? And this was mm -hmm. 12 years ago mm -hmm. before the word fractional ever was around. Mm -hmm. So I started doing contracting sales leadership sure. and I had two clients working with. Okay. Uh, and so that's what I've been doing on and off for the last 12 years uh, is helping companies that have that gap. Um, you know, they're not doing things in a consistent manner. They're not meeting their revenue. They're, mm -hmm. they got customers that come and go and mm -hmm. they find themselves engaged in bad, bad, uh, customer engagements. And mm -hmm. it's about creating that consistency out there. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think coming from an engineering product management background, I'm very process numbers mm -hmm. oriented. 
mm-hmm. that unlike, I think a lot of, um, salespeople, I, I kind of bring that into the discipline, mm-hmm. uh, which, which has served me well. It, it's been mm-hmm. able, it, it's helped me to really go have an impact, uh, on the companies that I work with. Right. And now you said on and off, so I don't want to get too far into this, but what, what did you do during the off and why were you off? off again? Uh, well, yeah. I, I had companies that came to me and started off as part-time uh, mm-hmm. fractional worker. And they said, you know, we, we come do this full-time for me. And uh, it was just the right opportunity. Right. I like right, the right, team. Right. I, like, right. I like the challenge. Sure. Uh, I'm a, I, I'm not a turn the crank guy. Michael, if you came to me and said, I have a business that I want to grow 3% year on year, uh-huh. I'd go, eh, there's probably better people for that. Right. I, I like the, it's a mess. We don't know how to fix this. We uh-huh. want to go grow this whole new thing. I love ambiguity. I love challenges. Right. That's that. that's the stuff that gets me up in the morning. Right. And so when I've had a CEO come to me and say that, it's like, all right, let's go do this together. This sounds mm-hmm. fun. Nice. I love that. So when we're working with businesses, um, most of our, our listeners are small to medium size and, and most mm-hmm. of them, most of us are in the, you know, consulting B2B service providers, uh, fractionals, um, if you will. And what do you feel is like the most common misconception about sales leadership in small organizations that might just have the sales staff of one? And a lot of times that person is the owner. Yeah, I, well, I think the biggest mistake made is lack of focus. Um, it, it's really developing an ICP, and, and I mean a robust ICP that really challenges what you do and how you spend your resources. Mm-hmm. Um, people can get too wrapped around chasing the shiny penny. Mm. Hey, you know, g- give me any big logo. Amazon called me. This customer called me let's go, you know, and, <laughs> and you have to step back and go, hold on. Does this really fit with what we do? Right. Do we have a chance to win, mm-hmm. you know, and asking those hard questions um, and companies don't do that well. I mean, mm-hmm. it, it, they, they tend to get, they tend to get too excited mm-hmm. too quick. Mm-hmm. And, and again, the type of sales that I focus on, which are things that take a long time to close deals, mm-hmm. you can't, you can't just randomly chase stuff. Mm-hmm. The cost of sales is too high. Right. So you really got to think about, all right, it's going to take me nine months to close this customer. And I'm going to have a lot of people involved and invest a lot of time and money. Is this something I can win? Mm-hmm. Is this something that fits my product? It's my mm. customer service model, mm. all of these things. Mm-hmm. And if not, walk away. Don't don't, don't spend time on it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that needs to be challenged throughout the cycle. You, know, you could so. be three months into something and go, okay, we started off here. Mm-hmm. Now it looks like it's here. All right. We stopped doing that. And, right. and those are the things that I've been successful at doing and helping companies really get that discipline around how you go do that and, and run this marathon. I love that. And I, I mean, you hit a, a beautiful chord when you're just like, not all business is good business, you know, right. and even if you want it, what would that mean to the company? You know, and yep. how do you, how do you get paid? Like uh, so many people, they look at you, you said cost of sales yeah. and in service providers, you know, it's a matter of manpower. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, when you're sitting there talking about bringing on somebody like Amazon and maybe you have a team of two or three of you and Amazon's going to want five or six of you in a matter of weeks. And we all know that when you're talking about that, that type of expertise, you don't just open up the phone book and call a couple of people and all of a sudden you have, you know, you double up your, your, your team. So, I mean, there are, you know, we, we talk about luck, right? Luck is uh, opportunity meets preparedness. And I think that uh, sales opportunities, you know, people say, you know, oh, you're, you're good in sales because you're just lucky. Well, that means that I am always looking at the opportunities. I'm always prepared for the right opportunities. And I think that being able to say no to the wrong opportunities, regardless of how beautiful it might look in the end, it's mm-hmm. like a journey to get to a win might be so treacherous that it would bury you. And I've seen right. that for sure. You know, people trying to bite off more than they can chew, even though it would be a good fit 
maybe if they were five years older as a company and had more infrastructure, yep. right? And that type of stuff. And like you said, like a nine month sales cycle. I mean, yeah, wh what what could you do with six months of that if you just figured out in the first 90 days that one, your chances of winning are less than 10%. And two, mm -hmm. um, it's not going to be, a, if, if somebody's taking that much time to to make that decision for for a lot of my, uh, the, the clients that I work with, it's like, if you can't make a decision in 90 days, they're probably not a good fit for you, right? Because right. we don't work with firms that have a hundred people in the acquisition and development department that can handle right. nine month you know, sales cycles. That's huge, right? Yeah. You know, but but ninety days is pretty common, right? When you're not talking mm -hmm. RFPs, and I'm sure you're talking like you know requests for referrals, requests for quotes, and stuff like that. Well, it, it can be RFPs, but sometimes it's just regulatory. Like I've sold. Uh, materials into people who make medical equipment mm. well you kind of get that initial traction but they've got to go through fda there's mm -hmm. three years oh, I mean, yeah. we yeah. had one market mm -hmm. we were servicing it was three years there could be other agencies mm -hmm. uh you know even if you're like selling a component into a pc mm -hmm. well they got to get ul fcc they got to get certified mm -hmm. by microsoft if it's mm -hmm. a microsoft component there's just these sometimes the nature of the engagement oh yeah drives the cycle mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh government like you said mm -hmm. is notoriously long but sometimes mm -hmm. things are just naturally that long of a cycle mm -hmm. just from initial market inquiry mm -hmm. all the way to a revenue producing point yeah especially i, I would especially say in can um you know production of, of hard goods I could def definitely definitely mm -hmm. say that, especially in technology. Yes, definitely in the serv service sector. I think it that's I think gets shortcutted as long as you have like for you know if you're going to work in government, you need to make sure that you're you're set up in SAM and all the other things that you need to right. be able to accept that business, even bid on that business. It's like if you don't have this this certification here, right. you you're can't not on that even... schedule or yeah, something like all that. that. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So what when when we talk about um, business owners being the salesperson, what would you say is the most valuable piece of that in a growing entrepreneurial sense, but also where, where's the biggest con? Uh, are you talking about founder led sales and, mm -hmm. and what's the con? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, well, I think traditionally, and most founders come from a technology background or something like that. Some mm -hmm. of them come from the business side. But most of them just haven't haven't been exposed to the variety of ways to drive revenue mm. and the successful models. I mean, and I mean that even if you're in the SaaS industry, and yes, there's a lot of repeatable models out there. Mm -hmm. But buyer journeys are changing. I mean, buyer journeys have changed so much over the past five years, and I think are going to change even more going forward. Mm -hmm. And for a founder to stay on top of that understand that hey well maybe this industry was doing this should we should we try that and and, and try to utilize that to better give us a better winning rate create more mm -hmm. efficiencies and things like that i think that's hard for founder-led sales just to have that exposure now mm -hmm. i think that comes from advisors consultants fractionals mm -hmm. i I having been a founder before, mm -hmm. I've used those outside entities for my blind spots, mm -hmm. uh, and 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 I think quickly realizing, hey, this isn't my sweet spot. I'm I'm big on the industry. I'm big on the technology. Whatever that founder is and mm -hmm. creates the expertise, at, th then utilize smart people out there. There's a lot of people out there. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's marketing, whether it's SEO, you know, whatever it is that can give you that added advantage mm -hmm. um, to really go drive revenue. I love it. I love it. So what would you say the biggest con to that then is? Or did I just, I think that, did you intertwine no, that? And I, just, no, 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 I, and I, I think it's a good question. I think it's, is, I think the biggest con is making sure you partner with someone who has lived your stage. Of mm. life cycle mm. i think 
I see a lot of early stage companies because I mentor inside of some incubators and stuff. Okay. Okay. Um, so, and having been a founder and been in Silicon Valley for 15 years, I, I, I've lived the life and done a lot of work in the startup world. And I see too often someone comes out of big name brand, mm -hmm. Amazon, Microsoft, take that. Mm -hmm. And then they want to work with startups. Well, mm. They've never lived the, <laughs> you're, you're the chief cook and bottle washer. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, they're used to having a team of 300 and a budget of X million to go do something, not bootstrapping. And, uh, oh, by the way, I'm the sales guy and the marketing guy, and I'm going to go do BDR work all at the same time. <laughs> so I always encourage founders to find someone who's lived their journey. Mm. Um because they can be strong in their discipline, mm -hmm. but if they haven't lived that journey. It, I mean, it's a different world. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's mm -hmm. do, doing early stage stuff is you, you got to be adaptable. You got to be able to do a lot of, wear a lot of different hats. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a founder should have partners like that, that have, that have done that journey before. I a hundred percent agree with you. And I think that the fractional uh, market has allowed for more of that help without right. equity because in the past what i've seen um is that you they, they give away a lot of equity for the guidance right mm -hmm. because they can't pay them anything they don't have any money they have more time than money and that's why they're doing the all-nighters that's why they they end up divorced and and their kids don't know what right. their dad looks like anymore and stuff like that so i think that we're in that age now where you can get somebody with some like you, the amount of experience you bring in just sales to be able to right. say hey listen for a fraction of what it would cost to even give me a half a percent of your your multi billion potentially multi billion dollar company, because I mean every, they're all looking at it going, it's going to be a billion dollar company. Right, so if I give right. you a half percent, you're going to make millions. I don't know how many times I made I made a, a, an oath not to uh, do sweat equity um, <laughs> services a long time ago because I'm, like, I'm with you. I, 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 I paid my bills on sweat equity this month. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> but, but with that, though, having the fractional to be able to say, hey, listen, you know, sales is very important. Marketing is very important. They are usually the founders, I think, are so product centric and they are so they believe in their and passionate about their product and, and or their service so much that they're blindsided by the things that they need to know about their sales cycle and mm -hmm. how to even sell it. I, I do mentoring for an organization called Warrior Rising. And we mm -hmm. work with veterans who are transitioning from military life to entrepreneur, oh, entrepreneurialism, cool. right? Cool. And I mean, whew, it's amazing because they watched all the shows and they watched Shark Tank and they watched it. Da, 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 and then it's like, <laughs> it's right. all, it's all just, it's easy. And it's this and it's that. It's like, That's right. no, those like, even the people who get signed up on Shark Tank only, what was it like 22% of them even get a full deal and only a percentage of those 22% make any money. <laughs> Go anywhere. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> So I think that it's important to be able to leverage the expertise of fractional consultants like yourself um, in sales, mm -hmm. like me in marketing and anybody that is going to help you get a good picture of your business as a whole of what it's going to take and when it's going to be necessary for you to get more support. Because as right. you uh, as you are um, you know, realizing your goals, you know, if everything is working out mm -hmm. the way you thought it would or at least where it's in the direction that you want it to go, that means that more and more of what you don't know is going to start creeping in because the bigger it right. gets, the more complexity. So that leads me to my next question in mm -hmm. how do you help th um, these startups go from every, like basically uh, grassroots marketing, right? It's like, it's right. uh, how many pitches can I do? How many, you know, whatever it is that they're doing, right? Um, they get past the whole like, uh, series A funding to at least give them a runway, but then at some point they're going to have to get sales, right? How do you bridge that gap into getting them past that into a set sales environment in their company so that they can actually count on sales giving them money versus looking for the next round of funding? Yeah, I mean, so we're going to create a lot of focus there. Uh, mm -hmm. We want to understand that we've got a good ICP and that's not just hey, I sell software to small businesses. Mm. Okay, that's, not, that's not an ICP. You know, it, it, <laughs> I really want to understand if someone walks in the door, you go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
that's my customer. And so there has to be some unique criteria in there that only points to your business and your type of delivery. And so we're going to work on what that is and then start lining up the organizations for externally and how we're going to do that. That means sales, that means marketing, and that means product too. So here's the unique thing that a lot of people I don't think concentrate on is, you know, you can talk about a lot of sales and marketing alignment, making sure messaging and things like that are going. Mm -hmm. You really want to get this right. You get product involved just as much mm. because then what happens is because again, in the type of customers that I work with, you're shooting ahead of the duck mm -hmm. to go make these things happen. Right. You got to know the product mm -hmm. is stepping along with you. And oh, by the way, you want product bought into what you're doing. The mm -hmm. last thing you want as a sales and marketing team is to be out there, you know, talking about how great this is or what we're doing next for you, Mr. Customer. And products mm -hmm. off down another path. Mm -hmm. And if you, I think it's a three-legged stool. If you get all three entities working together and understanding how you want to go monetize what you do, I absolutely believe you, you have a much better chance for success.